Welcome to the United States President's Unit. We're going to be studying the first seven presidents of the United States, from George Washington all the way through Andrew Jackson, and everything in between. So get your notes out, and make sure that you are following along as we go through these slides. And also write down any questions that you may have on the margin of your, of your packet. Remember, if you have your packet completed and you take the unit test at the end of this um, packet on Moodle, then you may be eligible to join into the constructive classroom that we're going to be, uh, or the constructivist classroom that we're going to be having during this unit. So good luck, work hard, and pay attention. All right, George Washington was our first president. He served from 1789 to 1797. Um, and as you can see there for his background, he, his public service is, was nothing new. He was in the public eye for most of his life. He was born in Virginia on February 22, 1732. He was born into a pretty wealthy planter family. Uh, but when he married Martha Custis in 1759, he became one of the richest planters, and many say the richest planter, in the entire United States. His father died when he was 11, so he became the owner of uh, a smaller plantation. His career began in the British Army. He was an Army officer during the French and Indian War. And after that, he became more America-minded. He served in the First Continental Congress, so he protested against and tried to um, discuss with the British and against the British. He served in the Second Continental Congress, and then he was so well-liked and such a natural leader that he was appointed as Commander-in-Chief of the Continental Army during the American Revolution. He led the Army through the American Revolution, into our uh, the new nation. He beat the British and with help from many others and he was eventually chosen as the president of the Constitutional Convention. So he was a military leader, a political leader, and eventually he becomes a our national leader as the first United States president in 1789. He was also elected to a second term as U.S. president and all said and done, he served from 1789 to 1797. After retiring to Mount Vernon in 1797, he died two years later. Here's a picture of George Washington in his younger years in 1776 as uh, crossing the Delaware and attacking the Hessians. And then we have Washington's presidency in 17, uh, from 1789 to 1797. So he was sworn in as president in 1789, as soon after the Constitution was uh, ratified. John Adams was chosen as his vice president. And Congress, under his, uh, under his rule, Congress passed the Federal Judiciary Act, which created the Supreme Court of the United States with only five justices. And Washington, his job was to appoint those justices, so he appointed John Jay as the first chief justice. That's a perfect example of uh, checks and balances. Congress had to create the Supreme Court, but then the president got to choose the Supreme Court. And who do you think approved those appointments? Well, it would be Congress. Then uh, Washington got to select his cabinet, who acted as his advisors, <clears throat> those Advisors were Thomas Jefferson in the Department of State, Henry Knox, he was the head of the War Department, Alexander Hamilton was the Treasury Department, and Edmund Randolph served as the Attorney General. These four men had been with Washington throughout his um, military years and his political years, and they would continue to be a great source of knowledge and advice for Washington. Here's... Um, George Washington being sworn in as our first president. He has his hand on a Bible, and he is saying uh, his oath of office, which is drawn out or spelled out in the United States Constitution, Article 2, Section, I believe, 4. Okay, now after the uh, Constitution was written and the new government went into power, Hamilton, uh, Alexander Hamilton, worked to solve many of the problems that came about because of money in the United States. First of all, there was a lot of debt, 
and so Hamilton worked to combine all state and national debt into one large debt so that it was easier to pay off. Kind of like your credit cards today. If you have 10 credit cards, they're all maxed out, it's easier to refinance all of them into one big debt and pay on it rather than 10 little debts. They'll take forever to pay off. Hamilton also issued bonds to begin paying off debt. Bonds were kind of like credit or um, printing, printing money, printing credit for the country so that they could pay off the debt. Individuals could buy these bonds and eventually um, it's kind of like people giving a loan to the government and he used that loan money to pay off debt. He also created the first bank of the United States and it was the bank used by the government to deposit money and to borrow money from. And, and Congress had the power to make this bank, had the power to make the money, He had, uh, and Congress had the, the power to um, borrow and raise taxes as well. He also suggested taxes to raise money for the government, such as the whiskey tax. And uh, the whiskey tax was extremely unpopular because whiskey is something that people want and they don't want to have to pay a tax on. They... Uh, you know, hold that near and dear to their hearts. So the gist is this. Western farmers, they didn't like this whiskey tax because they made their corn into whiskey to sell to eastern cities. Whiskey was kind of like today we have bottled water. Well, it's, it's important. And uh, back in 1794, whiskey was extremely important to those western farmers to make a living. It was cheaper, it was easier to transport to eastern cities, and they could make a lot of money off of it. So in 1794, western farmers began the Whiskey Rebellion. Farmers took up arms and chased away tax collectors, and they kind of made it kind of scary out on the western frontier for tax collectors to go and do their job. So Washington's job, his one of his powers is to enforce federal laws because he's the chief executive. So he sent 13,000 soldiers, and he led 13,000 soldiers west and put the rebellion down. And when the farmers saw such a huge and powerful force, they uh, quickly agreed to pay the tax. Here's an image of American farmers doing what, the, uh, what Americans do best, burning tax collectors' houses and tarring and feathering tax collectors. They saw the taxes as unfair, so they fought against them. Oops. All right, so what do we need to do? During Washington's presidency, an interesting, an interesting uh, event started to happen, and that's the growth of political parties. So during his presidency, people started to become aware that there were a couple of different ways to run this country. And so when, when these groups got together, they would say, well, I like maybe this kind of law. I support taxing those whiskey uh, producers out west. And so those people that supported that tax, they would get together and work together. And the people that opposed that tax, they would get together and work together. And so naturally, just like all human beings, um, people started to group together based on their wants, their desires for the government and for the direction of the country. So um, officially we say that political parties began in 1792 and a political party is a group organized to promote specific political goals and support candidates for office. Hey! Political parties under Washington developed because people did not agree on what the government could do or how much power it should have. Remember, this was a brand new constitution, and people didn't know exactly how to interpret every little line. It would take years and years and centuries even to um, figure that out. And even today, we haven't figured that out. So the two sides were basically between Thomas Jefferson and Alexander Hamilton. Now, Jefferson believed that Alexander Hamilton was making the government way too powerful. Uh, he and James Madison formed the Democratic-Republican Party. And the party was supported mainly by farmers, and they believed that the government should be kept small and that it should follow the Constitution word for word, or what we call a strict interpretation. So a very limited amount of government intrusion in people's lives and a very limited amount of power for the government. Now, Alexander Hamilton, on the other hand, he supported a strong national government. 
and so he and John Adams created the Federalist Party. This party was supported by businesses and manufacturing people in the East. They favored a loose interpretation of the Constitution. So if you remember our whole talk about the uh, elastic clause, um, a loose interpretation of the Constitution, according to the Federalists, might look like um, the fact that the, con the Congress could make all kinds of laws. They could make that bank for the United States, even though the United States Bank is not in the Constitution. Um, they could make any kind of taxes that they want. They could tax those uh, the whiskey out west. But the Democratic Republican Party, they wanted a strict interpretation of the Constitution. And so the uh, Bank of the United States, according to Jefferson, was not legal. It's nowhere in the Constitution, so it shouldn't exist. So um, the two parties began because of arguments about, who, about how to read the Constitution. Now, Washington, he remained popular with both parties because he didn't even become involved in either of the parties. Um, and so in 1792, he was re-elected as president. I believe that this is in your packet. It just shows the two differences, or well, many differences between the two parties. So take a moment, you can hit the pause button, and uh, just look at these two tables. And you need to understand the major differences between the Federalists and the Democratic Republicans. On the international scene, there were problems between France, or problems between the United States and France and Britain during Washington's second term. Um, during his second term, the French had a revolution. In 1789, the French Revolution broke out, and many, many Americans supported the revolution because the revolution was between the lower and middle classes revolting against the nobility and the rulers of France. And that reminded a lot of Americans of the American Revolution. But soon, many Americans stopped supporting the French because the French got crazy. They started being violent with their people. They were chopping people's heads off with guillotines. Um, there was a lot of chaos. Women and children were suffering. Innocents were be innocent people were being abused. It was no good. Uh, it was not what the American Revolution m looked like. So, um, in 1793, the U.S. government issued the Neutrality Proclamation, and it was a way to stay out of any European wars that might be started because of the French Revolution. And there were many wars because of the French Revolution. There was a war in Austria, in England, and um, all over Europe. Okay, this document declared that the U.S. would remain neutral in any war. And the U.S. would continue to trade with all nations of Europe, regardless of warfare. So, this kind of put the U.S. in a funny situation, because if France was fighting England, England was fighting France, and the United States is trading with both, well, we're not going to, you just can't please both sides. So England would see the United States as an enemy for trading with France, and France would see the United States as an enemy for trading with England. Uh, the word neutral means to not take a side. So because of the neutrality proclamation, uh, British ships, British and French for that matter, started seizing American ships and sailors. And so if a ship was going to France from the United States, the British would take the ship, take the crew, take the cargo, and it would all become British. And vice versa, if the French captured an American ship headed for England, they would do the same. Take it and bring it to, to France. Now this made the, French, or the Americans extremely angry, and uh, it, it's illegal. So the Americans had to do something about it. This word, that word to put soldiers into, uh, or to put sailors into work for another country is called impressed. And that's the practice by the British and the French, just doesn't say it here, but the practice by the British of forcing American sailors to serve in the British Navy. And that is going to be a practice that causes all kinds of chaos in British-American relations. Another problem that the that Washington dealt with was Britain maintaining forts on the American borders. Now, after the American Revolution, the British were supposed to move their their forts out of the West, but they never did. And so they stayed out west. They encouraged 
the Native Americans to fight against the Americans. And all the while, they just did not follow the Treaty of Paris that was signed after the American Revolution. So American tribes were fighting with the American. Native American tribes were fighting with the Americans. And it took a very large battle at uh, the Battle of Fallen Timbers in 1794 to end most of that fighting. Uh, during the presidency of Washington, fighting had taken place between Native Americans and Americans in the Northwest Territory. So Washington sent General Anthony Wayne into the territory to stop the Native Americans. Um, at the Battle of Fallen Timbers, about 2,000 Native Americans were defeated, and then the Native American tribes of the Shawnee, Ottawa, and Chippewa, who lost the battle, were forced to sign the Treaty of Greenville. Under this treaty, they agreed to give up their land and move westward. So this internal struggle against the Native Americans was caused by an external force, by the British telling the Native Americans to attack us. Okay, uh, once the Battle of Fallen Timbers had been fought and finished, um, Washington worked to settle all of the problems between the United States and Great Britain. So um, it started with John Jay, and uh, John Jay was an extremely important gentleman. He went to Britain, and he reached an agreement known as Jay's Treaty. And um, basically, he helped the British come to the conclusion that they should give up their forts along the American frontier, since that's what they agreed to in the Treaty of Paris. And now that their enemies, well, their their uh, Native American uh, allies have been defeated, they were left alone. So uh, <clears throat> England gave up their forts along the frontier. And then America also was having trouble with uh, Spain. And so Pinckney, Pinckney's treaty was um, created and negotiated by Thomas Pinckney. He reached an agreement so that the Spanish and the Americans could use the Mississippi River to ship goods. And uh, b basically, Spain was nervous. They were worried that the American government might try to take over Florida and out uh, west along the Mississippi. And America was eyeing to do that. And so uh, it gave Americans the right to travel the river and to go through New Orleans. And it set the boundary between Florida and Georgia where it is, well, where it was at that point. So uh, Pinckney's Treaty just shored up relations between America and Spain. Now, in 1796, George Washington retired as president after his second term in office. And then he decided not to run for re-election. He gave his farewell address and said that he wouldn't run for a third term because he believed that two terms was enough and three terms people would start to think of him as a king and he and others did not want that. So um, since Washington was the first president, he created a lot of precedents and a precedent is an example set by one person that becomes standard practice for others. Some of those precedents are the fact that he gave a farewell address, that he would give an annual State of the Union address, that he would only serve two terms in office, and there were many others. And uh, Washington, he was lucky because he got to set those precedents, and he did a really nice job. And other presidents after him, they obviously followed those precedents. Um, at the end of Washington's uh, presidency, this blue area is where the United States controlled, had influence over, of course, these states, the original 13 states. And then we're going to see what will come of all the rest of this land here in the North America. John Adams was the second president of the United States. He served one term from 1797 to 1801. He was born in Massachusetts on October 30th, 1735. Uh, he became a lawyer in Boston, and he married Abigail Smith in 1764. He was the, uh, the lawyer for the British soldiers that were arrested after the Boston Massacre. And he was, he was kind of a hard guy to work for and work with. He was just uh, a difficult personality. Great politician, though. Um, he had the, our nation's best interest in mind. He worked all uh, day and night doggedly to um, advance our country. 
and advance law in North America and in, in the United States. His political career was illustrious, um, meaning that it was very, very important, very uh, proud. He served in the First Continental Congress. He served in the Second Continental Congress. He helped to write the Declaration of Independence that created our country. He was chosen as the first vice president under George Washington, and he was elected as the second president of the United States, with Thomas Jefferson being his vice president. And he eventually died in 1826 on the 4th of July. During his presidency, there were different problems that he had to deal with at home. Um, political parties were growing rapidly, and they were fighting each other for political power. The two parties, again, were the Democratic Republicans and the Federalists. And Washington, or I mean Adams, he was a Federalist. And his vice president, Jefferson, was a Democratic Republican. So they were always at each other's throats. Um, in 1798, Congress passed a set of laws called the Alien and Sedition Acts. And two of these law, the, the two parts are the Alien Act, which increased the length of time uh, newcomers had to live in the United States in order to gain citizenship. It increased it from five years to 14 years. And then the Sedition Act outlawed sedition. Those two laws, what they did was they limited the power of individuals. Basically, it, uh, it made it so newcomers couldn't vote. And so um, the politicians could silence immigrants. And then the Sedition Act, which in sedition is saying anything false or critical about the government, outlawed sedition. Well, that meant, I mean, man, listen, just imagine that. It limited the voice of people. So Jefferson and others that were really interested in personal freedom, they got really nervous about this. Um, Jefferson and Madison, they wrote re resolutions challenging the federal government's power. They said, hey, we have the First Amendment that says no laws will limit speech, be it sedition or not. And uh, so the two resolutions that he and Madison wrote are known as the Kentucky and Virginia Resolutions. Um, and what they said was that these, these resolutions said that the states do not have to accept or follow unconstitutional laws passed by Congress. States could nullify or cancel such laws. Uh, so before the Supreme Court stepped in and said these laws, these, the Alien and Sedition Acts, are unconstitutional, well, Jefferson tried to give that power to the states so that the states could nullify laws. And... Um, if you think about it, there's this funny balance between the federal government policing its own poor laws with the Supreme Court, or do the states police bad laws written by the federal government? So you have a balance between federalism and federal power. Uh, Jefferson, because he stood up for these or against these laws, he gained a lot of popularity from the common people, the poor people, um, the people that normally were not listened to by federalists or by the rich. These common people said, hey, Jefferson, you're going to fight for our rights. And um, so they followed him and supported him into the next, during the next election.